Yes, good morning, everybody. Noel, thank you for the kind introduction and welcome, everybody. So it's, uh, it's Saturday morning when you pretend you are not sitting here today, being at home and uh, thinking of your last week and the last couple of weeks, what you did as a urologist, performed five to ten radical prostatectomies. So do you think of the prognosis of the patient? Does it matter? Do we need to know? Does the patient want to know how long he will live? So the topic, prediction of survival of men with prostate cancer after radical prostatectomy is a tough one. Do we have tools? Yes, we have tools. We have nomograms. Do we use those tools? Who's using nomograms? Let's have a morning exercise. Who's using nomograms? Who's not using nomograms? So sparse use of nomograms. So what's the reason? So we'll just uh, come to this topic. Um, as Noel said, I'm from northern Germany at the Baltic Sea from Lübeck, Lübeck University. Here are my disclosures. And um, as we know, radical prostatectomy is an established treatment for clinical localized prostate cancer. We've discussed a lot on the topic yesterday already and we'll discuss more the next days. And despite the recent advantages we have with radical prostatectomy, with radiation, with focal therapy, with a robotic minimal invasive surgery, we still have a risk of recurrence in up to 30% of men undergoing, underwent radical prostatectomy. And this biochemical recurrence can lead to metastatic progression and also to prostate cancer-specific mortality. Although not all men with biochemical recurrence ultimately experience this uh, prostate cancer-specific mortality. And here is uh, evidence behind that. We have a lot of publication just, this is just some of them focusing on the topic of recurrence post-prostatectomy. And here I've summarized the factors, the clinical pathological factors that can predict the outcome after radical prostatectomy. It's surely not PSA, PSA doubling time, it's a Gleason. Just for you to wake up to refresh what we have on our hands to, to use in pre- and post-operative setting. We have the time between radical prostatectomy and biochemical recurrence. We have a pathological stage, we have the surgical margin, we have the high Gleason, which has been published on the surgical margin, lymph node metastasis as a strong factor of disease recurrence, tumor volume, seminal vesicle invasion, age, specific age, and again coming back to PSA. So the probably most important and routinely used clinical factors is PSA, Gleason score and clinical T stage. And these parameters can individually and independently predict clinical outcome after surgery. And those have been used with many more to be integrated in clinical models, <coughs> mathematical models to increase, to predict the ability that it's not just a gut feeding, you have a high Gleason and say, okay, your risk is about 20 to 30 percent. You really want to, you want to be a scientist, a surgeon scientist, you want to predict, you want to tell the patient the number, even though you don't really know if it helps the patient when you tell him you have a risk of dying of prostate cancer of 10%, 20%, does it help the patient? I'm not 100% sure, but however, there's a lot of evidence in this field, and this is one example uh, of a, a patient, a publication in almost 2,000 patients with localized prostate cancer uh, Gleason uh, equal or, or higher than seven, clinical T stage two and three. And this uh, publication showed a high interaction between PSA level and Gleason score. And high preoperative PSA level correlated significantly with worse Gleason and higher risk of heavy, having poorly differentiated prostate cancer. And those predictive models of biochemical remission or PSA um, occurrence can be improved by considering the interaction of PSA and Gleason score. Gleason score seems to be an important marker at the surgical margin and positive surgical margins with high Gleason is a poor predictive factor as summarized in many publications, just some of them 
here for you as demonstrating the evidence. So what mathematical models we have that can or might be able to predict clinical outcomes after radical prostatectomy. And we have those user-friendly lookup parting tables, for example. We have artificial neuronal networks. We have risk groupings. We have a classification and regression trees and probability graphs and what we initially ask you, uh, nomograms that can be complex to use is probably the most accurate tool for predicting outcomes of patients post-surgery. So let's look at the data, and this is not all. And we have, if I would have asked the question, who have, has published with, or co-authored a nomogram publication, it would be probably the same within the auditorium than the ones that raise the hand that use the nomograms. So, um, but we can discuss later in the, in the clinical case discussion. So there are a lot of nomograms, and some say you have the problem once they are published, they are outdated. Then we have the discussion yesterday, what about MRI? It's not using MRI, it's not focal therapy. So I will show you some data on that. So we have parting tables, we have the, we have the look up tables. Those are the most widely used tool to predict pathological stage at radical prostatectomy, published 1997. It takes into account the PSA, the Gleason score, clinical stage that I use to predict the probability of organ-confined disease, extracapsular extension and seminal vesicle invasion, as well as lymph node invasion. So you can discuss with your patient what is the probability and then decide whether to do extended lymph node ex uh, um, surgery or whether you should do or, or can perform nerve sparing surgery in this situation. So it helps discussing with your patient what's the best treatment modality. So the advantage, it's simple to use, it's ready for the office, it's uh, online available, we have tools, we have apps, and the disadvantages is that the extracapsular extension prediction is not really site-specific, and external val validation, which has been performed, often showed conflicting results. And then we have nomograms for predicting of pathological stage as at point of radical prostatectomy. And this is a Hamburg nomogram published by Thomas Stoiber et al. And it's predicting of site-specific extracapsular extension based on the variables we see here um, with Gleason score, percent of positive biopsies. And it was developed in a large cohort of the Martini Clinic in Hamburg with a prostate cancer and showed the 84% occurrence and was also externally validated for patients undergoing robotic prostatectomy. So this is one of the um, more novel tools, as, as well as the Galena nomogram, a preoperative prediction of seminal vesicle invasion based on a clinical stage. So here you can, it helps you to educate or to, to discuss with your patient whether you can perform a nerve sparing procedure or not, or predict um, the, the, the prognosis in this situation when seminal vesicle invasion is, is uh, suspected. We have the preoperative, highly cited, well-known catanomogram for prediction of biochemical recurrence after radical prostatectomy. Those nomograms predict the probability of five and 10 year freedom of PSA progression after radical prostatectomy based on clinical stage, PSA, primary and secondary, biopsy Gleason score. So this takes the secondary Gleason, when you have a secondary Gleason of four or five, into calculations. It has a relatively high accuracy and um, is in use in most, 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 some of the clinics. And also we have the revised by Stevenson uh, um, nomogram that includes prognostic information after system, systematic biopsy and adds the number of positive and negative biopsy results. So you see within the trend of development of prostate cancer diagnosis, the nomograms are also developing and getting updated. However, accuracy and prediction rates stay about the same. So what else can we do? We have post-operative predictive models of biochemical recurrence. We have the Diamico, Cat and Stevenson again, Waltz, Wadi, and with the different variables that's taken, that, that have been, has been taken into account. So um, 
this is a lot of data to use. So we will have to discuss which is the best or at the end what we use or why we don't use the nomograms. So we have the post-operative predictive models, the CATA nomogram, this predicts the five-year biochemical based on serum PSA final Gleason score. So this is just, this is the difference is not preoperative, it's a final Gleason post prostatectomy. And it also takes into account capsular invasion and uh, lymph node surgical margin status and was, was developed in a cohort on almost 1,000 patients with clinical localized prostate, uh, prostate cancer who underwent radical prostatectomy just by a single surgeon. So this is very unique in this uh, CATA nomogram. It was externally validated with an 80% occurrence. So this is one you could surely use. And also the Stevenson nomogram, which has been published some years later uh, in 2006, um, showing the update of the, of the post-operative CATA nomogram you saw on the top. Predictions can be adjusted for disease-free intervals and the years of surgery. So here, how does it work? You all know, I mean, I don't have to, have to show you. You have those apps for nomograms. You have online tools. We can print them out. So it works basically that you look at um, the pre, post, or in this case, post-operative variables like lymph node invasion, yes or no, the primary Gleason, post-operative PSA, and then you calculate the points, and then you end up a total number of points, and you put it in a nomogram, and then you, you can calculate the risk of recurrence for this example. So very easy to use tools, and as said, um, nowadays they are readily available on the web, readily available as an app, so we can and we might use them. So what about long-term endpoints? Long-term endpoints, the probability of progression to metastatic disease and uh, recurrence of disease, so hard endpoints, based on pre- and post-operative clinical parameters, limitations, so there are a lot of publications, but the limitations are that they are in most times not externally validated. And again, um, what does it help us in the situation when you know a patient has a risk of developing metastasis? Let's say 25%, 22%. Does it help the patient? Does it help us? I would say yes, it helps. Because we know which patient we have to look for carefully or which patient we have to do an MRI or PSMA pet again. So I think it's good that we raise the awareness and I, it has tough times to, to re-motivate those or take out the basement, those, those tables again where nobody uses them because I think they will be of use with the novel developments we are uh, discussing today. And another nomogram, and that's, I, I just took this in detail because I think it's important to look at um, how nomograms are being developed. And uh, the Sporta nomogram, um, when you read this and um, look at, let's say, let's go one further, and look at how you use it, so you would say you get more points for a higher T stage. You get more points on the scale for Gleason sum and comorbidity. But what about adjuvant radiotherapy? When it's yes, you get more points. So that doesn't mean it doesn't help. No. And going back, the patients that received adjuvant radiotherapy had a worse prognosis in this cohort. And this I would like to use as an example how complicated it is to use nomograms in the clinical setting. Because in this situation, um, it, the cohort was biased. Um, I mean, it was not biased, but um, the patients um, got adjuvant radiotherapy when it was a high risk of recurrence, when they had a positive surgical margins or lymph node positive or in early PSA rise again. So those are the reasons um, why we have to carefully look at why a nomogram, which, which variable is used. And um, so summary and limitations of predictive models, we have a lack of independent validation. We um, have a validation in a single cohort, predictive accuracy, calibration, level of complexity and study selection criteria, adjusted adjustment of competing risk and the choice of long-term endpoints biochemical recurrence, metastatic progression, and uh, biochemical recurrence in this situation. So shall we use models, yes or no? We will have to discuss within the panel later with you. I'm uh, here for you for questions, and I think 
um, we have to we have to look at also novel ideas like taking MRI into those nomograms. We've just slightly touched this topic yesterday and uh, summarized that MRIs are not really used into, into nomograms, and it's correct, rarely used. So we have some publications looking at preoperative multiparametric MRI as a predictor of uh, biochemical recurrence after radical prostatectomy. So in this uh, cohort of 370 men diagnosed with biochemical recurrence following radical prostatectomy and a preoperative PSA biopsy and MRI suspicion score was statistically and multivariate analysis, and this resulted in a nomogram predicting the risk of biochemical recurrence 36 months after radical prostatectomy. So there are uh, um, publications looking at this topic, and here you have MRI suspicion score <coughs> taken into this nomogram, low or high, However, this was, was uh, defined by the authors, but uh, nowadays we use those novel, novel diagnostic methods. Not PSMA PET, not um, whole body MRI, but MRI of the, of the pelvis. And those are the publications with fairly large numbers of patients. Addition of MRI to nomograms improves the accuracy of prediction of pathological features after radical prostatectomy and here you see when comparing with the 70 to 80% initially presented by the historic or older nomograms, this might add, add to a more accurate prediction of biochemical reg remission after radical prostatectomy. What about molecular biomarkers? We will hear the next speaker touching on this topic, so we'll just briefly um, show you those three publications from the Vienna group, uh, Sharok Shariat, Stevenson also, and Katten. They also used some molecular, or let's say, um, uh, uh, lab values like TGF beta 1, IL-6, or gene expression signature, and uh, the currency is not really exploding. So it might add, but uh, I'm not so convinced with those uh, biomarkers, but maybe in the future this might change, and we will hear the next speaker on this topic. So management treatment options for recurrent disease after radical prostatectomy, we have salvage therapy options after biochemical recurrence. We have local therapy, we have systemic therapy, we have, let's say, experimental uh, techniques, chemo, high-intensity focused ultrasound brachytherapy. So we have options to, again, cure the patient. So I think it's good that we, that we take out those nomograms again, look at them with novel imaging modalities and uh, work with them, validate them, and use them in clinical practice. So predicting survival, my conclusions for men after radical prostatectomy, we have those well-known clinical factors like PSA Gleason and clinical T-stage that are traditional preoperative predictors of clinical outcomes after surgery. The combination with pre- and post-operative variables into mathematical models using nomograms can um, enhance the accuracy of prediction of pathological stage and outcome. We have discussed that I've uh, shown you the PARTIN tables, the catenomograms that are the most liable, reliable models of outcome after radical prostatectomy. Incorporating of imaging technique and novel molecular markers, if we will have, into existing models may guide treatment choices after, uh, for, for, for detecting and also uh, working with biochemical recurrence after radical prostatectomy. Dear colleagues, friends and guests, it was a pleasure to be here speaking and thanks a lot for your attention with some greetings from Lübeck University and my team. Thanks a lot for your attention.